Hello, thank you. This is Bill Peake. And once again, I want to thank Dave Whelan uh, and the Talbot Spy for creating this partnership with the Talbot County Free Library that gives me the opportunity to speak to really interesting writers and poets uh, about their work. And today's guest, in honor of Frederick Douglass Day, which is Saturday, September the 26th, um, is the, a world-renowned expert on Frederick Douglass, Professor Celeste Marie Bernier. Celeste Marie Bernier is Professor of United States and Atlantic Studies at the University of Edinburgh, Scotland. She is the author of over 20 published and forthcoming single and co-author edited books, including African American Visual Arts, Characters of Blood, Suffering in Sunset, Stick to the Skin, If I Survive, which is the book we're going to talk about today, Living Parchments, Back into the Battleground, and the Anna Murray Frederick Douglass Family Biography and Writings. You know, Thank you so much for being with us, Celeste Marie. Uh, and, and I have to begin by asking a question I'm sure you get really tired of hearing. How in the world did a woman with a French name, uh, an Irish English accent, who lives in Scotland, become <laughs> a, a world expert on America's great abolitionist, Frederick Douglass? It's a, it's a long journey, and um, Mr. Douglas used to say, I'll, I'll start a long journey short and then take his time, so I promise not to do the same. Um, in terms of how I got into Mr. Douglas and his life and the story, in Britain, as a white supremacist nation that Frederick Douglass described as a nation with its hands in blood of the peoples of color across the world, enslaved and free, we like to remember abolition. We like to remember the white male great folks of abolitionist history, and we like to forget the history of slavery. So I grew up in a really poor backwards um, area of the west of England, Northern Irish immigrant, French Canadian immigrant history. And I grew up around folks who hated empire, hated everything that England stood for, especially in Northern Ireland with the presence of England in Northern Ireland. And growing up at school, all we ever heard of was that Britain as a nation made the world pink and that it controlled the world and that it was the superpower. And all we learned was that it made its money in trade. And I remember asking in school, um, what did they trade? And I got told spices, cotton, and I didn't get told anything else. And I went home to my community of people and um, my grandfather just said, traded in enslaved people for centuries and millennia. And so through family history and commitment to understanding, there's another story to be told that's hidden in the white supremacist um, archive. I started to try and learn about stories by people who lived and experienced. And one day when I was passing a bookstore, there was this um, book by a man called Frederick Douglass. And little did I know that was gonna change my life. And I started reading it and heard his words and felt his story and understood, as he described it, the urgency, moral, social, political, and emotional of bearing witness. And so his story, his life, as a way of understanding, as he said, the millions forgotten, murdered in history became kind of my life's work. So that's, and has been so ever since. <laughs> I'm impressed by the fact that your grandfather knew about the, 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 the slave trade. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed that he was aware of that and, and would pass that on to you. So he, really it was my, my mother. It was really my mother. My grandfather, all he knew came from my mother. Oh, uh, I see. My mother was a person committed as, as, a, as a white woman growing up in the middle of nowhere in Northern Ireland and then in England. She was a person committed to anti-racism and anti-discrimination and pro-equality work in all its forms. She was a, a social justice person and she grew up destitute, poor, with nothing, um, suffering all forms of abuse herself. And she understood the solidarity, as Douglas describes it, of struggle, that we fight across all our pain, all our suffering, and we translate it into social justice action. And so 
though she somehow learned and understood the history of slavery with never having got it out of books. And really, I think drawing on a lineage that Douglas himself, who spent a lot of time in Ireland and Northern Ireland, and who he himself said he had never seen such atrocity outside of the South, except on the highways and byways of Ireland, where he saw the blood and bones of people dying on the sidewalk. So that kind of long history of Ireland um, and its tangled relationship to racism, all the problematics of it, Douglas um, understood all of that, but also Douglas saw Ireland and Irish sensibility as an anti-slavery transatlantic force against transatlantic liberation as against transatlantic slavery. And so I think my mother is, is a, a sort of a, a part of that in some long distant form. <laughs> Your book, If I Survive, is a terrific collection of, of, of documents and, and letters. Um, I, I think your preface to it, there's a section in your preface that really captures the book's human appeal, and I wonder if you would read that for us. Re recognizing that the Frederick Douglass that is needed in a 21st century Black Lives Matter era is no fallible icon, but a mortal individual. This volume cuts to the heart of Douglas's family relationships. While the many public lives of Frederick Douglass that we know as the representative fugitive slave, the autobiographer, the orator, the abolitionist, the reformer, the philosopher, and the statesman are and continue to be lionized worldwide, the aim of this book in which we publish the Walter and Linda Evans Douglas collection, alongside essays, alongside annotated transcripts, is to shed light on the many lives of Douglas, not only as a public icon, the renowned author and activist, but as a private individual and a family man. All of life can be found within these pages, romance, tragedy, hope, despair, love, life, war, protest, politics, art, and friendship, as the Douglas family work together for a new dawn of freedom. And it's really true. I mean, it's, it's a remarkable book. And you really do feel, reading through it, you know, you, you meet Douglas not just as the great orator and great abolitionist, but as a father and as a grandfather. Um, uh, what a great man. Um, and, and Walter, this is from the Walter O. Evans collection. Can you tell us who is Walter O. Evans? So Walter Evans is a staggering inspiration who has a phenomenal collection. So he is world renowned as an art collector. He has one of the biggest collections of African diasporic art in the world, but he also has over 100,000 documents in which the Douglas collection is part of that. So he has Malcolm X's prison letters. He has a original narratives by enslaved authors. He has John Brown's life and testimony before he goes to his death. He has all types of materials in the social justice liberation movement. So my friendship and meeting um, Dr. Evans as an inspirational collector, as a historian, as a thinker, as a political radical, as an activist, changed my life and was the way and made it possible to tell the Douglas family story in and of itself. It was a, a transformative um, moment. I, I gotta tell you, listening to that description, that litany of, of, of amazing objects and, and documents, how in the world did he conserve all that? How, how does he keep it? Oh, it's a lifelong dedication um, and a lifelong determination and priority. So um, some of his materials and collections are archived in different repositories across the world. Um, Savannah College of Art and Design has the Walter O. Evans Wing, which has a phenomenal collection of his African-American art. Um, but you speak precisely, Bill, to the importance and the social justice responsibility and vision of this collection, which has at the heart of it. The, the key and vital priority is that his documents, his manuscripts, and his artworks 
all together work as a way in which culture is a weapon against all forms of white supremacist annihilation. And Dr. Evans, as a thinker and an educator, a political activist, sees this collection as part of a liberation movement to keep telling the stories, sharing the histories, memorializing the lives that help us learn and live and work in social justice today. My, my wife is a, is a PhD historian, and I remember when she first started teaching me about African American history, this is embarrassing to admit, but I, I found myself thinking, they don't have any history. Um, you know, that's how bad it was, and that's how important what you're saying is. And it's, that's how important what Walter O. Evans' collection does. You're absolutely right. That's terrific. History makes all the difference. When we have a history, we know, you know, it, 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 it informs and fills and fleshes out of the lives of all these people who otherwise would have been anonymous and lost. Thank you so much for that, what you're doing. Well, well thank you. And I think, you know, Walter's whole um, commitment comes out of that understanding of the lack in white mainstream schooling, in national schooling, in national curriculum. And as he said, his family taught him his heroes. His family taught him um, Douglas. So the, the thinking through the, the family across the diaspora, um, African diasporic families as carrying the stories, telling the histories and being the educators. So let's talk about uh, Frederick Douglass's family. And let's begin with, with his first wife, Anna Murray Douglas, who was also the mother of all his children. What can you tell us about her? So Anna Murray Douglas was an inspirational legend. And I'd like to share with your listeners and with you some powerful words that she said. Um, and she said, um, why not I endure hardship that my race may be free? Why not I endure hardship that my race may be free? My husband is battling with the minions of oppression. I will fight injustice in the schoolroom and the streets, and my children will be spruce and neat. So Anna Murray Douglas was Douglas's equal, was Douglas's support, was Douglas's political inspiration, was Douglas's co-worker in anti-slavery struggle, was um, a business executive and political thinker. Um, and the terrible reality is that she has been um, elided, erased from history, as have his children. And what is tends to be spoken about is the great Douglas living human voice. And the reality is there were the Douglases living human voices. And the Douglas voice was made up of Anna Murray, Rosetta, Annie Douglas, uh, Charles Frederick Jr. and Lewis Henry. And they together were the first family of black liberation. Anna Murray, um, Douglas described her and the children called her Mother Douglas. And he himself was called Father Douglas. And when she died after a marriage of 44 years, Douglas described the pillar and the post of my house is fallen. I do not know how to carry on. And so for Douglas, Anna Murray was his inspiration, was a political thinker and activist in her own right. Um, one of the very little known or talked about realities is her leadership work on the Underground Railroad. So Frederick Douglass is away a lot of the years, um, a lot of the months, killing himself on trains, on coaches, on roads, starving, um, at many points suffering from severe cold and illness, speaking at 10 a.m., 2 a.m., 5 p.m. And who is at home running the family and um, running everything in Rochester but Anna Murray Douglas. And so Rosetta talks about um, every night she is woken up by the cries of fleeing humanity from the prison house of bondage. So Anna Murray Douglas raises the money that helps Douglas's escape. Anna Murray Douglas has the idea that he dress as a sailor, makes the sailor's outfit, and is the source of Douglas's um, home and his life. He describes it as, without my home life, I couldn't be Frederick Douglas. And so Anna Murray is a figure who is vitally important in the struggle. Um, one of the things I often tell people, Bill, is that this 900 page book is the short story. <laughs> Um, <laughs> frighteningly, what I'm working on right now and losing my eyesight doing is the Anna Murray and Frederick Douglass family papers, which is three volumes. And in that research over decades, I've 
found over a thousand speeches, letters and essays by all of the Douglas members. And Anna Murray was the life artery of schooling the children and Douglas in all forms of the liberation movement. Um, and she also, just real quick, don't I remember from David Blight's book that she also, on top of everything else she was doing, maintained a beautiful garden around their house that, that Frederick Douglass liked to walk in and, and contemplate in. Uh, what an amazing woman she must have been. The, the basic rule with Anna Murray Douglas, Bill, is she could do everything beautifully, inspirationally, brilliantly, and perfectly. Yeah. So absolutely a beautiful gardener, a phenomenal chef, a phenomenal yeah, chef. Right. So she was really everything, and she was everything to him. And that's why in this world that we're in, we need to make sure we are respectful and we understand and we give due importance to the mother, uh, as um, Frederica, her granddaughter, described it, the mother of Cedar Hill and the mother of the Douglas family. Well, speaking of Rosetta, let's let's move on to her because I've always been interested in Rosetta. Uh, uh, Rosetta Douglas, and then is it Sprague? Is that how you pronounce her last name? That's okay. right. That's right. Yeah. The uh, uh, what can you tell us about her? So Rosetta Douglas Sprague was a legend again in her own right. Um, the um, power of her story is multiple and many, and I keep on finding more. Um, Rosetta Douglas Sprague was an educator. She worked as a teacher in her younger years. Um, one of her key roles was, as she described it, as my father's amanuensis. So she wasn't just his amanuensis as an intellectual political thinker in her own right. She was also his editor and his arguer and his debater. And she and Anna Murray were the life force in his life, educating him around women's rights issues, um, around all kinds of political realities where their presence isn't currently thought of or understood in relation to the formation of his thinking and his beautiful and powerful radicalism. Um, Rosetta was a prolific writer. And so in the volumes I'm working on right now um, and transcribing, um, she wrote um, hundreds of letters to newspapers. And one of the most powerful discoveries I made recently is she wrote under a pseudonym, as so many of the children did, which is his own journey and his own difficulty, Bill, but oh, her... Yeah. Her pseudonym was she campaigned just, and worked for all forms of civil rights, all forms of anti-lynching campaigns, all forms of education rights. Um, she worked very carefully on reform of all kinds for working uh, to eradicate poverty injustices. And she wrote the first biography of her mother that still stands as the most definitive um, exploration into Anna Murray's life. Um, at the time of her death, Rosetta was writing the first history um, over centuries of black women's radicalism. Oh, wow. um, but she we, we had all kinds of difficulties with her eyesight. And by the time that she died, she was, as Frederica, her daughter describes it, blind from all the work that she'd done, um, helping her father proofreading the North Star. I can't tell you how much it makes my heart start to pump when individuals talk about Douglas as doing the North Star on his own. He was doing that as a collaborative family effort in which every member held a hand and Rosetta worked proofreading line by line from the age of 10. So wow. uh, the fundamental role of Rosetta in Douglas's thinking. The other beautiful, beautiful story is that the letters Rosetta writes to her father survive. And so in the one of the many volumes that I'm doing of the Anna Murray and Frederick Douglas papers, she writes to her father and his letters to her also survive. And what you see is this beautiful relationship. And I think one of the most powerful and beautiful ways to understand Frederick and Rosetta Douglas's relationship is she says, when he dies, she says, I not only lost my father, I lost my mother, my brother, my sister. He was everything to me. And so Rosetta and Douglas had a close bond. Um, Douglas described her as the pulse of my heart. You know, the, a, a son that I really didn't know much about at all until I started reading your book, uh, it, fascinating fellow, is, is Lewis Henry Douglas. Uh, and you began in there, there, you have a collection of his correspondence with the woman who, 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 whom I believe becomes his wife, right? Um, and her name is Helen Amelia, and then is it Logan? How do you pronounce that last name? I think you need to tell me, Bill, with me being on the other side of the Atlantic and all my accents, I'll probably fail. Uh, I have no idea. But, Logan, uh, Logan, maybe. Logan, okay. Well, the, uh, you described their relationship and the letters between them, which are beautiful. 
as an important archive of romantic love among elite African Americans in the 19th century. Um, can you tell us a little bit about what you mean by that and about the relationship itself that the correspondence reveals? Mm. Well, the beautiful words that Lewis describes is he's writing from the Civil War, which I know that we'll talk about in a moment, um, just giving people a little preview. And he's writing um, love letters to her from the front, front lines. And what's so powerful is he is facing every form of life and death struggle, and he keeps insisting to her, do not forget me. And he says to her, the men tell me here that sometimes we're mistakenly listed as dead. Don't give up on me. Come and check. Make sure, because if I can, my life's breath in my body, I will marry you. And so they had a beautiful correspondence together. Um, Amelia Loguen was the daughter of Jermaine Wesley Loguen, who was a man who escaped from slavery in Tennessee and one of Douglas's very closest friends. So Jermaine Wesley Loguen and his wife Caroline, Amelia's mother, ran the Syracuse Underground Railroad and they had thousands coming through their doors at any one time. And so the relationship that Helen, Amelia, and Lewis had was one that came out of a shared struggle. Um, one of the less told stories about Mr. Douglas is the psychological pain he suffered, the, what he suffered all his life of remembering what he had gone through and what all his brothers, sisters, family had gone through in slavery. As Douglas described it, it's the pain of my soul. And that pain of soul lived on in Jermaine Wesley Loguen. And there are letters that survive between Amelia and Jermaine Wesley Loguen, her father, where she talks about easing the pain in his mind. And so Lewis and Amelia shared a, set, a relationship born of fathers who had been born into slavery and who went on to be liberation activists. And so their um, love story in these beautiful letters that's told over many, many letters tells their experiences of great love for one another. And Lewis kept saying, you are the undying love story of my life. I had no idea. Lewis Henry uh, served in the, 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 the most illustrious of, of African-American units, probably in the Union Army during the Civil War, the 54th Massachusetts. Not only that, he apparently, I didn't know this, participated in the famous assault on Fort Wagner. But what's neat, and it, it, I think it's so human, it reminds me of letters home from World War II, is you can read the letters, and I did, I read them closely, all, he writes letters all around that assault, before July of 1863 and after July of 1863, and there's no mention to his girlfriend of the, of the battle. Do we know anything about his participation in that and what, what, what his participation in combat was like? Well, I've got a little surprise for you, Bill. So okay. um, uh, those letters are not in If I Survive, it being the short book. And so um, what I'm working on right now is I'll share you a little preview of the letters that are in the Anna Murray and Frederick Douglass papers. Right. So um, here's Lewis talking to you with your question. Okay. I have been in two fights and I am unhurt. I'm about to go into another, I believe, tonight. Our men fought well on both occasions. The last was desperate. We charged that terrible battery on Morris Island, known as Fort Wagner, and were repulsed with a loss of 300 killed and wounded. I escaped unhurt from amidst that perfect hail and hell of shot and shell. It was terrible. Should I fall in the next fight, killed or wounded, my dear Amelia, I hope to fall with my face to the foe. We have established ourselves as the fighting regiment. Now at the same time, the same evening, the same pencil, he writes another letter to his mother and father. Saturday night, we made the most desperate charge on the war on Fort Wagner. Our loss in killed, wounded, and missing was 300. The splendid 54th is cut to pieces. Our officers, with the exception of eight, are killed or wounded. If I die tonight, I will not die a coward. Goodbye to you all. Goodbye, Lewis. 
Wow. Now let's move on to the next, another brother. Uh, and I, I've never known how to pronounce his middle name. Charles, is it Remond Douglas? Yep, that's I'm named after Charles Lennox Remond, oh, one okay. of his close friends, the abolitionist radical sure. from Salem. Yeah. Okay. Uh, in, in, in one of his letters home to his father, he's also in the Union Army, he describes a pretty serious row he's had with another Union soldier, an Irishman. You Irish, I tell you. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm he, sorry. <laughs> he writes, and this is a quote, I quote, I felt as though I could whip a dozen Irish. I did not care for them because I had my pistol and it was well loaded. I'm all right for I've got my mind made to shoot the first Irishman that strikes me. They may talk, but keep their paws to themselves. <laughs> was he always such a fiery fellow? Oh, yes. His letters to his father are definitely the letters of the youngest son. So he absolutely categorically tells Douglas how it is and as it is. And he and Douglas get into a big disagreement conversation, depending on whose side of the story you're on, about the fact that Douglas learns that Charles has been stealing food. And um, Charles um, writes to him and he says, you do not know that we are dying out of camp. We are dying of starvation and we steal to survive. And so Douglas is, is corrected at that point. He also tells his father, he says, I will not desert, I take a bullet first. And so that fiery young man that you're describing is all through the letters. And what is very powerful about that is Douglas's sons educate Douglas on the realities of life for black men fighting in the front lines. And yeah. Douglas starts to change his mind. So whereas Douglas and Logan are killing themselves, recruiting in every state, getting men to join up the 54th, there's a Logan guard, Douglas is giving talks and says, unchain your mighty black hand in the fight for liberation. And it's Charles's letters that makes him see the racism, the discrimination, the unfair treatment, the numbers of black men dying in camp before they even get into combat. Um, part of Lewis's letter on Fort Wagner says, we died in such numbers because the white troops couldn't be made to come forward. And so it's at that point that Douglas tells Lincoln, I will not recruit another soldier for you until I have confirmation and assurance of equal pay, of safety to soldiers. And so Charles is confrontational and unflinching spirit, the spirit of Douglas, if you might say, as, as an 18 year old man himself, very much lives on throughout his life. Uh, toward the end of the book, uh, we're treated to an exchange of letters that I love between uh, Frederick Douglass as grandfather to his uh, grandson Haley George Douglas about a it's a th for, it begins with a thank you note from Haley to his grandfather for a flute he sent him I assume Haley's pretty young at this point and uh, uh, and and then the grandfather writes back and it remind you know you can see it it just sounds it just sounds like something my grandfather would have written to me when I was a little boy uh, you know that sweet sort of avuncular tone. Um, uh, it, it, I loved it. Can you tell us a little bit about that? One of the most beautiful and powerful ones is Mr. Douglas used to shut the door in his study in Cedar Hill and the little people would be playing outside and Friederike used to say, our grandfather had two distinct times of day, playtime and work time. And when he was in work time, we would creep along the corridor to wait until the door was thrown open, he had a whistle and he would carry us and we would know that we would play. Um, Douglas saw himself as the, the very powerful grandfather who sought play and joy and would have the children lifting weights with him um, on the grounds of Cedar Hill. He would play hoss as he described it and have them ride on his back um, and he'd play wheelbarrow um, and as Frederica used to say if any of us used to cry we'd be handed back to, to mother. <laughs> <laughs> back to mother. Um, I think, you know, one of, the, one of the powerful stories of Grandpa Douglas and Grandma Douglas is um, one of the stories around their life in Cedar Hill and a moment when a woman who's destitute, who was born into slavery, living as a woman in the freedom that's in name only in DC, comes to ask for bread at the door. And um, Douglas is in his study and um, Frederica and Estelle, two of Rosetta's daughters, are playing out front. Um, and the woman comes to the door and Anna Murray says, I'm so sorry, I have no food left for you today. 
and Estelle is filled with fire and runs up to her and says, Grandmother, how could you turn her away? And the study door opens and Grandfather Douglas appears and he says, what are you saying to, to Grandmother? And Estelle repeats this story and he says, what have you got in your hand? And so Estelle sees that she's got her own bread and jam. She runs after the woman and gives her her bread and jam. Meanwhile, little Frederica is looking at, at that and she's running up behind. She's a, many years younger. And she watches as Grandmother Douglas gives Estelle another piece of bread. And she says, where's mine? <laughs> and Frederick Douglass, um, as she says, took me on his lap and he said to me, but you didn't give your bread away. So you don't get any more. And she says about how this gave me a life lesson in struggle. Um, the other story she tells is Douglas's hair being plaited by all the grandchildren. One of the things that he used to love is all the grandchildren making plaits and ribbons in his hair. And she talks about one evening where they're all making all these plaits on grandfather Douglas's hair. And then a famous senator arrives and Rosetta and Anna Murray have to take Douglas to the back stairs and quickly unplait his hair. <laughs> uh, the, you know, these, 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 the these the correspondence the documents everything in this book if i survived is so intimate um and it reminded me reading it sometimes i found myself you know i love archaeology um but every now and then when i'm reading a, a description of of, of you know an, an excavation done at some ancient cemetery in in rome or greece or, or egypt and and they exhume some small child's body and, and examine the grave goods, I find myself thinking, you know, this is sort of an invasion of privacy. I'm not sure I should be reading this and, and thinking my academic thoughts about it. Um, did you ever find yourself feeling that way as you were uh, uh, examining all this remarkable material? I'm really grateful to you for that beautiful question. And I, um, the, the, the key point to always know in working on any project, but especially with the Douglas family, is it comes with grave moral and emotional responsibility that I never forget any second of every day of my life I'm working on the Douglas family collection. And a vital part of the work is doing the work of respecting and understanding stories that can be told and stories that can't be told. And so in 20 years of working on Mr. Douglas and the Douglas family, I've pieced together a lot of different stories. Um, I understand a lot of different aspects of lives. And there are some letters, there are some stories, there are some pains and some clear private issues that it would be an ethical violation to go anywhere near. Um, and yeah. the key priority I have as a researcher is understanding the Douglas's family as a family voices for freedom and family voices for struggle. Um, as Frida Rica describes it, the united child power of liberation. And so I've been and I am very careful, especially now I'm writing the first biography of the family in this bigger project of working very respectfully uh, about areas and covering areas that are their social justice mission and that work to forward that and to in no sense commit any act of violation, commit any act of infringement of privacy, um, because as you say, it's the life artery and I think starting working on this kind of material comes with a respectful listening and an emotional understanding that is the most important thing before anything else. Hey, listening to you, Celeste Marie, I, I, I found myself thinking, you know, you must be a, a, a remarkable teacher. Uh, uh, I, I, would, I would love to have you as a, I would love to have had you as a professor, although <laughs> you probably weren't even bored when I was in school yet, but the, uh, uh, but uh, uh, I thank you so much for everything you've done. I'm afraid we have to end it here, but I, I just want you to promise me that you will keep doing this kind of work, keep doing this kind of research, keep telling these marvelous stories and never stop teaching, okay? I'm so grateful to you and everyone in Talbot County and to the Frederick Douglass Honor Society, my lifelong family. Um, a piece of my heart is with you all in Maryland always. Thank you so much. Did you ever come across a, a, a friend of Douglas's by the name of John Jones from Chicago? Yes. 
Yes. Could you 